Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, I am really excited, genuinely excited about the person I'm about to interview. He was a Baptist pastor who was pleasantly surprised when he found out he was able to go to heaven and he went twice without dying. And his journey to heaven is something you will want to hear. You don't want to miss it. It's so genuine in the heart of this person you will basically see you're going to see as he speaks his name is pastor john green john green thank you so much for being with us today well thank you so much it's such a great pleasure and to be here with you and the audience there in america and from around the world so john you you're in australia since you said that That's you right. know <laughs> yes yeah, so you're in australia and thank you so much for being on so tell us first how did everything start for you? You're not from Australia originally. Where are you from? <laughs> You're right. I'm not from Australia. Uh, I am from South America, from Chile. So tell us, when you were a child, did your family, yes. was your family a religious family in any way? Well, Jennifer, you know, um, the only one in our family that really knew the Lord Jesus and received him as Lord and Savior was my father. We all came to know the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Lord when we arrived to Australia. But the first uh, few years, only my dad was a believer. And those first eight years of my life in Chile, they were just fantastic. They were awesome. Uh, we lived in the city down south of uh, Santiago. Santiago is the capital of, of Chile, but I lived in a, in a down south in a um, city called Temuco, and that's the third largest city of Chile. And uh, we lived there, and uh, we had a very, I had a very uh, awesome life there with my brother and my two sisters, and um, and I remember it well. And my grandmother, you know, she had a farm, and I used to spend a lot of time in the farm, and uh, it was a real healthy atmosphere and a loving family. My parents, uh, my father's already gone to be with the Lord some 20 years ago. But um, those first eight years were just awesome and fantastic. But I will remember one day where we were outside with my dad and, and he had a friend there at the farm. And uh, all of a sudden I look up in the sky and there's a jet stream. And my father said, son, do you see that jet stream? That's a plane. I, and, and I just marvel at that, and um, because I'd never seen a jet, you know, a, a plane that big. And he said, "Soon we're going to be going to another country called Australia." Around seven years old was my first time I had gone to a church, a Christian Alliance church in my city, only about five blocks away from our house, because this elderly couple used to watch us kids play on Sunday morning outside. My brother, my sisters. But we didn't go to church, and um, this couple were well known by my father, and they were an elderly couple who were going to church at the Christian Alliance Church. And one day they said, "Let's go and talk to the dad, and let's get permission to take these kids to Sunday school." And that's uh, my father, of course, said yes, no problems, because he knew them very well. And the first couple of weeks, we started going to Sunday school, and for us, it was something new. I mean, this was the very first time I was in a, a, a Christian environment, in a church, and for the first time, I began to hear about Jesus, about God, about the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand it all, but I knew this was a special place. That was the initial start of me knowing a little bit about God, and the interesting thing is, is that in 2017, I was in Chile. I went to preach the Word of God, and I went back to the same church there at the Christian Alliance Church, and I did a conference for pastors and leaders. And when I walked into that church, Jennifer, it's like deja vu. It's like going back to the same place. And I was in tears watching that place and just thanking the Lord that I had that journey that um, at eight years old, that my first time, and and uh, and the church hadn't changed much at all. And when I went through the hallways, I went through the back of the church, and we had a conference there. I was just rejoicing in the Lord. And uh, it's amazing what happens. You know, time goes by, but then the Lord takes you back to the roots of uh, your journey, and He surprises you to no end. So you can also enjoy and taste. How good the Lord is when he takes you through this journey. So, yes, that was 
my first encounter in Chile, but my real one was when we came here to Australia. Australia. And was it 11 years old when you accepted Jesus? Yes, he was 11 years old. We actually arrived in Australia in 73. And then, of course, we started going to a Spanish church, Baptist church. Now, we had cousins there, and uh, they told us, hey, come to church. And, and we began to go. And all of my adolescent and youth was spent at the church. The Lord touched my heart with the gospel when I was at 11 years old. And this was the most amazing, miraculous moment I had ever lived in my life. One of them, but the most important, because it's where I understood that I was a sinner. Yes, I was a kid. You know, sometimes people say, but you were just a kid. I mean, what sins did you do? But the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And uh, I knew that I had sinned, you know, even as a child. And I remember well when the pastor was preaching on John 3.16 and it was in the evening and I was sitting at the back of the church and I was holding on to the chair with my arms because he was really preaching and the Holy Spirit was so working in my heart and in my mind, calling me to give my life to the Lord because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he was just tugging at my heart so strongly. And the pastor at the end was saying, I know there's someone here who needs to give their life to the Lord. He said it once, then he said it again. <laughs> and then on the third time, I let go, my fingers let go of the chair. There was something trying to stop me, stop me, but I let go. And the moment I let go and I stood up because he was calling us to go to the front, I stood up and I was very shy and timid, but I stood up. It was only the Holy Spirit that did this. And as soon as I stood up and began to walk, I felt like a backpack on my back of sin just fell off and I felt weightless. I felt the presence of the Lord all over me. I was in tears and not knowing that I was the only one that went to the front. <laughs> but it was the best day of my life and I will never forget it uh, when I met Jesus, my Savior, my Lord. And wow. that's why it's so important. I tell people it's so important, so crucial for parents to be so sensitive to their children and for them to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and to know them. So from there, you are in Australia. You start a whole yeah. new life and your parents move into a haunted house. Oh, How my goodness. In <laughs> How in the world could that happen? I know. I know there are many listeners right now that are listening to this. And uh, I want to share something very important here because... I was looking at some statistics uh, there in America, and one in four to one in five houses, uh, it's estimated that, that that have some type of paranormal activity in houses in America. And I was just looking at these statistics, and um, it's a larger problem than what people really want to talk about. I call it the silence pandemic, <laughs> spiritual darkness pandemic. Because this is a real problem around the world. And whether it be a palace, I went to see a, a couple here who are multimillionaires. And they had a spirit living inside their mansion. And we had to go in and we prayed in the name of Jesus and the thing left. So whether you're a millionaire, whether you're a, a housewife, a husband, a worker, a truckie, I know there are many truckies out there that are listening to this. Just be aware that uh, this is a real world. And of course, the people that were living there were friends of ours before. Uh, and, and they went to the same church. But they never, they never told us that they had some extra terrestrial or paranormal activity happening in their home. And, uh, and, and you know, people say, but why didn't they tell you anything? Why didn't they tell your parents that you know before you you move in and rent the house or which is renting not to go in the house because there was some paranormal activity again we're talking about the 70s and uh people would not talk about this it was a silent nightmare if i can put it that way because it really was and people wouldn't say anything because just like today maybe there are viewers right now that are living this and they're not saying anything because, one, they think people won't believe me. Two, 
they say, who am I going to go to that can really help me, right? And sometimes three, we go to churches and even churches and leaders stay away from that. Or they say, go and look at someone else who does this type of ministry. And for me, that is shocking. That is absolutely shocking and not acceptable because the word of God says that the Lord has given us as Christians the authority from heaven, from the Lord Jesus Christ, to combat the enemy in the name of Jesus. And we can see the glory of the Lord delivering people. But all of this began when we moved into this house. It didn't start straight away. It happened six months after we settled down. And those first six months were fantastic. We were just accommodating ourselves to the house. From there, we would go to school. And uh, I'm only 13 years old. And uh, my brother was 12. My younger sister was about five years old. And my older sister was 14. And, uh, you know, we were all teens at that time, except my uh, younger sister. And uh, we were all happy. We're all going to church. We're Christians. By this time, we're all going to church. And we're all you know, getting to know the word of God. And I had already given my life to the Lord when I was 11. My brother had not yet until he was 14. He wasn't a Christian yet. Uh, but uh, my sister was, she was 14 and a half. She'd given her life to the Lord. And my youngest sister wasn't yet. So, and my mother, yes, by then she was already a Christian. She already received the Lord. So my brother, who we slept in the same room, but different bed beds, of course, I uh, just slept across me. And everything that I went through during that period of time, my brother was asleep. It was almost like the Lord was saying, he's not going to feel anything, see anything. He's not going to be traumatized by this. Uh, this is something that I've got for you, John. And let me tell you, when you, all of you guys who have gone through this would understand what it is to live in a haunted house. I mean, it was like living in a horror movie. I could hear footsteps running across the, the corridor. At first, I thought it was my parents or my mother. Uh, maybe she was doing exercise. Maybe she was running to the kitchen. <laughs> Who knows? I didn't. I couldn't figure it out yet. But it wasn't until then I realized that, no, my parents are sleeping. What's going on? And at first, I didn't want to get up because I thought maybe somebody had, um, you know, was inside a thief. Someone what, uh, had broken into the house. And uh, I was scared, you know, I wasn't going to go out there and, and, and try to confront this. And uh, But then after a while, after a few weeks, this continued. It escalated. Uh, I could hear the kitchen, you know, the cupboards opening and shutting. Um, pots and pans flying everywhere. Hey, so uh, did you see pots and pans? Yeah, 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 we would see. And even when we went in Christmas, when we had even in Christmas, we were setting up the, you know, the, the Christmas tree and all that decorations. This was during the day. And the four of us, brothers and sisters, we saw this. The whole thing just came towards us like somebody pushed it from behind and it fell on the ground. And we all looked at each other like saying, what was that? What happened here? There's no wind. There's nothing. But we never mentioned anything about it. And as a matter of fact, everything I lived through that time and my two sisters lived through that. We only talked about it some 15 years later. What they went through, again, was in their room and so personal, and they didn't know how to explain what they were going through. So what I'm saying with this is that it's not just hearing the paranormal. When it gets to the point where you're seeing demons come into the house, you're seeing these shadows, you're seeing these figures coming in, and it's like the atmosphere changes, like literally like a refrigerator, you can cut the air with a with a chainsaw. That's how thick it is. The hairs of your arms and the hairs of your back just stick up. It's a terrorizing experience. And, um, and that is happening today everywhere. Here in Australia, in, in many, many places, it's happening, but it's like a pandemic. It's a darkness, the kingdom of darkness attacking even more and more so now because the Lord is coming soon. So the enemy is getting desperate. He's getting desperate. And he, the enemy is even going into the entertainment world to try and make it palatable for people to think that, hey, this is okay. Let's get more magicians. Let's get more this and that. And, and, and the more spectacular, which behind it is all occultism and demons working through these people, but in a sophisticated way, what the devil does is trying to 
uh, you know, desensitize our very minds and our hearts, believing that it's okay, it's magic, but it isn't. That is all just smoke. It's uh, terrorizing. And for six months, we lived this terror in the house. And uh, praise the Lord, we weren't harmed. But uh, when a 13-year-old child, uh, you know, adolescent, and, uh, and my sister, who was five, was looking at these things, and they, she saw them come into the house. They bumped her. Uh, she, at one time, she was drinking some milk at the entrance of the house at night, at the front entrance, and she saw this figure coming from the garage, from outside, running, coming into the house, bumped her. She dropped that cup, and it cut her leg. Um, and, uh, and my mother went to her and said, what happened? What happened? And she didn't say anything because she couldn't say anything. It wasn't until years later that she explained that these demons were coming in and out of the house and, and she was terrorized. And uh, we did call our pastor from the church, the Spanish church. But again, you know, if you do not know how to cast these things out, they still stay there. It's territorial. And then when we found out that there was a family who used to live there uh, and they did witchcraft, they even put a pentagram on the outside stairs when you go at the back of the house they put a pentagram they drew there on the on the stairs and that's like a that's literally like a permission for demons to live there because they did a pentagram they did a pact a covenant and it gave access to these demons and then until you break that in the name of jesus which we didn't know how to do that at that time obviously we didn't know any of this um then of course once you break that and you bring angels to help you uh, do that. And in the name of Jesus, uh, they just bind those spirits. Had, had I known that, we would have bind all those spirits. I would have sent them back to hell. And uh, we would have been liberated, but we suffer for eight, uh, for six months. But you know what, uh, Jennifer, the Lord taught me so much during that time. He taught me as a youngster the reality of the spirit world of darkness. I had to see this. Because later in the years, I would be ministering in this area too and helping children, helping adolescents. We've got a case now, just last week at church, parents came, uh, they came for prayer and their daughter, who's only four years old, is being confronted by a demon telling her a dark spirit. She says, this is a dark spirit, the daughter. It says, tells me to go in the pool and throw myself in and kill myself. Or, I'm, or she's in the car and the spirit is speaking to her and telling her to open the door while they're driving to throw herself out. Now, my dear here is, um, this is a reality. And I know that there are millions of people suffering and there's no need to suffer because when we come to King Jesus, to our Lord, there is solution, there is freedom. The Lord is the one that can deliver us and free us. Because we are more than victors in Christ as Christians. He is our victory, the Lord. And with his power, the Holy Spirit, with prayer, directly prayer, specific prayer, uh, we can see the glory of God anyway. But the Lord was showing me all this at first, the reality of the kingdom of darkness. And then uh, I was telling you, Jennifer, before that uh, one night the Holy Spirit came into the room. Now, this is the work of God again, because this was a supernatural event. Now, I'm going to a Baptist church. I'm not going to a Pentecostal church here. I'm, I'm in a Baptist church. I'm learning God's word. But what's happening in my life is a supernatural uh, encounter to help me cope with what's happening in the house. And the Holy Spirit would come in mighty glory into the room. Now, my brother's still sleeping. He sleeps every night. He sees nothing because the Lord is shielding him, protecting him from all of this, but he's going to show him other things in the future. As a matter of fact, my brother, when we were in South America, he was giving uh, teaching and lessons about the occult to many, many churches in Latin America. And, and this was so liberating for the churches because nobody was teaching about the truth of how the enemy works and how he moves and the authority that we have in the Lord. So, yes, the Lord has used him in that area, but not lived out what I had to live out because the Lord, of course, individually works with us in a specific way 
according to what we're going to be doing for him. Anyway, the Holy Spirit came so glorious, so mighty. That light was so glorious, it lit up, lit up the whole room. I could not see. I had my eyes closed. And all of a sudden, it would come right next to me gently, just so gently grab me, and I would. he would just gently put me on my knees next to the bed. And then, you know, with that awesome, glorious touch, I knew that I had to pray. So I would just fold my hands and I would begin to pray. Many times I did not know what I was praying. I knew I was praying in the spirit. But because the, 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 the experience was so awesome and glory to God, I give glory to God right now for that experience. And, and I can feel that even as I'm telling you right now, I feel his presence and his glory right here. And, 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 and I would just fold my little hands and begin to pray until 6 in the morning. This was from 1 o'clock and uh, in the morning till 6. Then I, then I would go back to sleep because at 6.30 I had to get up, get ready. And at 7.30 I would have to leave to go to school. And this happened for one full month, every night. And the Lord gave me supernatural strength. I was not tired at all. I had this supernatural strength from the Lord because he was dealing with my life, preparing me. And actually, he, he was preparing me to face one of the demons that was going to come, not into the room, but just at the door. He was going to stand there, and he was going to wanted to confront me. And then I saw the, the mighty power of the Lord so shine. So he prepared me for one month, and then uh, one uh, at the end of that month, the next night, I didn't get up at 1 o'clock, and I found it strange. But I was sleeping, and all of a sudden, I, I sensed that someone was watching me, and, and I was on my side of the bed, but this feeling was horrific, was horrible. Uh, the hairs on my neck were standing up, but I had to see who it was. So I moved the, the sheets and the blankets. I moved, and I turned around, and I looked towards the door, and there was this demon, very dark demon, darker than darkness. Uh, you see the whole figure, red eyes, he was very, very upset, very angry, but he couldn't come in because the Lord was protecting me. He did not come in, but he, he made sure that I knew that he was there. So, and I'm thinking, and, and of course, I wanted to cry out to my parents. I wanted to shout out something. Nothing came out. I was stunned. I was frozen. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit was in me, said the word, Jesus. And as soon as he said, Jesus, this, this demon just looked at me. He was so scared. He turned around and he went down the hallway into the kitchen. At the back of the kitchen, there's a door that was locked and jammed, locked and jammed. He just opened the door and he slammed it shut. And, uh, and that was my encounter with that demon there at that moment. And then I just, when that happened, I put my sheets and my blankets on top of me because I couldn't, I, I saw what the Lord had done, but I was still scared. I didn't want to see it anymore. But what happened next? I sent someone else watching me and the whole atmosphere had changed. And I looked again, I, I removed to see who it was. And there was this angel as top of the door, right up to the top. It was so tall, beautiful, with a beautiful white robe. It was glowing of glory. And this angel was just looking at me with a beautiful smile and making sure that I was okay. So I, 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 in, a, in a space of one minute, I saw all of this. Now, one minute at that moment, it's a long time, right? A long time. The impression that you get as an adolescent to seeing these things is so phenomenal, so amazing. How do you explain that to your friends? How do you explain that to your pastor? It's very difficult but uh, I had to keep this in my heart, and I lived that, and, and this was amazing. Then I knew that God had power. Then I saw the mighty protection of the Lord. And then I saw that these demons, yes, although they come to harass, and they came to the house, and they were there living there, but when they saw the power of God and the mighty glory of the Lord, they ran like, you know, like cats out of there, <laughs> like scared cats. And uh, there was no way in the world they were going to hang around the glory or even the name of Jesus. Once you say that name, the name that's above all names, glory to the Lord. Uh, these these spirits are just uh, terrified. You know, the Bible says that the, the demons in James, the book of James, the demons 
believe and they tremble. The word tremble in the Greek means that they shudder convulsively with fear. It's not that they're just a little bit scared. They shudder convulsively. But, you know, all of that started, the ministry that I'm having now, it had to begin when I was 13 years old. You know, 13 is an age where it said where the enemy likes to come in, you know, to children at the age of 13, yeah. that number. But it's amazing because that's the age where you actually learn the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes. yes. So I have a few questions for you because I want to go back. You said a whole lot. And I know there's a lot of people <laughs> yeah. who have questions. So. I'm going to actually be those people and ask. So okay. why do you believe that these demonic spirits, people call them ghosts, but we know they're demonic spirits. Why do you think they do stupid things? Why do you think they make footprints noises and throw pots and pans and slam doors and all this stuff? Because I'm from Connecticut. So, I mean, we had yeah. a whole bunch of haunted houses there. Um, not me per se, but you know, it's haunted houses everywhere there. So yeah. why do you think they do these things? They want to they want to bring fear to men. The Lord said that the devil and, and, and his fallen angels, they come to steal, to rob, and to kill. So what they want to do is to bring great fear to mankind. They want to make sure that from their end, they want people to believe that they're the greatest power. And then when people are trapped in that power, that there's no way out, and they will move things around. They'll do all sorts of things just to bring terror and fear to people. And although it seems silly when you think about it, why pots and pans? Why move cupboards? Why move this and that? But that's like anything. I mean, you, if you watch a, a horror movie, just a little squeak of a door, you know, it's opening, and, and it also causes that impression of fear upon people that paralyzes people. And uh, they do that because they know that, that it's impressionable for mankind to know that there's something there, but they don't know what it is. And, and they, they fear the terror of what's going to reveal itself. And they do that because they want to captivate man's mind and man's heart. And almost like saying, you, there's no way out, out of this. There's no way out. And we've got you. And I even see, you know, it's crazy how people go to cemeteries and they're filming. They wanted to find ghosts. They wanted to find spirits. They're filming. And that is so dangerous. That's that's a realm that you don't even want to get into. But again, it's fashionable. Yes. It's paranormal. And people love to see that. They love to see that. But when they leave it, it's a whole different story. It's a whole different story. Plus, these are fallen angels that followed Satan when he rebelled from heaven. So their very nature has been changed and transformed. They're no longer beautiful angels. These are hideous creatures, spiritual creatures. They're in the spirit, right? But you can see them. They all have different personalities, just like we have personalities and character. But they're bent to sin. They are bent to destroy. They're bent to kill. So that's their nature. They cannot change that anymore. And once they know, especially the Christians are going to heaven, see, they had to leave heaven because of their rebellion. But they can see that we as Christians, we're going to heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And they hate that. They absolutely detest that with all their heart. Because I even asked the demon once when it was being cast out, I told it, I said, why did you rebel against the Lord? Why did you not stay in heaven and glorify your master, your creator? What led you to rebel? And they told me, literally, they were telling me, we followed Lucifer because he promised us greater things. And now we have nothing. Now we have nothing. It's amazing, you know, when you find out the reality, these realities are of fallen angels and, and, and they're... they're they have judgment upon them. They know it. Even when Jesus was on the scene in the first century, they would say, what have you come to have you come to bring judgment upon us? Our time has not yet come. Now their time is coming very soon because the Lord is coming soon. Praise the Lord. But the demonic activity is accelerating more and more and more. And you know what? It's attacking our children. It's attacking our young generation. 
more and more and more. That's why I said I have to prepare something. And I've done a pack, uh, a pack that's called, is on deliverance, but it's a pack that's called Setting the Captives Free. On the basis of what I went through, I want children, I want young people. I want, I've want. i even had a deliverance on a 92-year-old lady who did seance while she was in France when she was just 17 years old. And she did it out of just because her friends were doing a seance and she went in there not knowing at first what she was getting into. And this affected her life right up to 92 years old until we prayed for her until the Lord freed her and delivered her. It's just amazing when you see these demonic hosts, what they can do. That's why when the Lord began to show me these realities, I'm telling you, when the Lord sees a demon-possessed person, his countenance changes so much. Now, the Lord is love, the Lord is grace, but when he sees a person being hounded, tormented by a spirit, the Lord loves the person. Oh, but he's there's a holy wrath and holy hatred towards that demon that's causing all of that in the life of the person. And the Lord does not look at that at all in delight or happiness or joy. His countenance just transforms into the holy anger towards this. And he takes it so seriously. And that's why we should also take it so seriously, loving the person, but, you know, casting out and being militant with that demon and and that's so important i see that every weekend every week i see that and we're delivering people and through the power of the lord and the lord is a deliverer but the lord had to show me all of that uh when i was a child and yes they do silly things demons do some crazy stupid things mm -hmm. but people are afraid mm -hmm. and people you know once uh, look i've gone into offices i've gone into um offices into factories uh, places where millionaires are because their machinery breaks up all the time. You know, things are happening in the industry. There's no advance. And when you go in there and you, I start talking to them a little bit, okay, what's happened here? Then you find out that there's been witchcraft, occultic things happening. People have come in and they've cursed the place. And that place is going down financially. It's going down for the business person. And we go in there and we pray and the Lord just frees all of that, frees all of that. And guess what? People, again, they become successful because these demons want to destroy mankind in whichever way possible. They'll, they'll, they'll stop a factory. They'll stop a whole machinery. They'll stop, you know, they'll bring people down. They'll put self-limitation in people for years. But the Lord was teaching me anyway at that age, and I had to live through that because now I, I understand when a child looks at me and he says, I see figures in my room. There are shadows all the time. They're trying to talk to me. I don't say, oh, okay, just go back to sleep. It's okay. No, I know straight away what these things are. And then we talk to the parents and with the parents' permission, of course, once we speak to them, we and then we talk to the child. And then, of course, then the parents are concerned. Because then they know where this is coming from. And then we go into their rooms and we find out what's going on, you know. And uh, and sometimes even kids bring things into their room. I had a young girl who was only 14 years old. She was gothic. She was hearing only three songs, three songs continuously. And these songs, she wrote them up. I said, can you write these songs up? She went, came to the office at the church. And, she's, and, and she began to write, but not the normal way, right? She wrote it in an angle. All of it, the whole song, in a matter of 30 seconds, so quick, frenetically. And I began to read the song, and he was talking about suicide, kill yourself, take your life. And she was hearing that for three, for one year, locked up in her room. And I said, where are your parents? They're traveling. These parents are multimillionaires. Where are your parents? They're traveling. They don't care about me. I said, and how long have you been uh, listening to this music? For a full year. I said, this is the way you dress up. You paint yourself all black and all that. And she could see demons everywhere. She's only 14 years old. So the enemy is real. These things are real. It's happening all the time. And that's why I decided to write this, this booklet, I Saw His Glory, that people are going to be able to download of my story and the glorious glory of God, the journey that I went through, plus the package 
that I've got on my 16, 16 sessions on deliverance, because I believe that every Christian should have the knowledge and understanding that they have the authority of the Lord, Jennifer, to free themselves from any attack of the enemy. That's why the Bible says, what are we to do? We have to resist the devil and he will flee from us. But we can't even resist because we don't know how to, you know, and we get scared and we run away and we think by ignoring it, it's not going to be there. And and that's what that's what uh, the, the Satan wants and the demons want, for you to try and ignore it. But they're still there hounding, hounding, hounding. And that's why you get many people committing suicide. Even before what we're, uh, we're going to share about heaven, this is just before all of this about heaven. But, you know, it's a journey that the Lord takes us through. And he began my journey when I was 11. I came to know the Lord. 13, when I came to have my encounter with the Holy Spirit and prayer. And then uh, learning how to, even as a child, learning how powerful the name of Jesus was. Because the Holy Spirit interceded for me. And he said the word Jesus. Such a wonderful way the Holy Spirit speaks. And then I saw the uh, the reaction of these demons, you know, and, uh, and and that's glorious. And I want people to understand this. Greater is he who is in us, for us who are Christians. We have the power of the Lord, the presence of the beautiful Holy Spirit. He is mightier and glorious because he is God, the Holy Spirit. But we need to learn how to confront the enemy for our families, for our children for work and to see the glory of God shining and liberating people. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, that we have this authority given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. So as soon as we confront the enemy in the name of Jesus, you will see the glory of God. So all this, right, and you're mentioning all these people who've been involved with the yeah. occult lifestyle. And even if they yes. did it once, like the 92 year old woman, there are some people, a lot of people believe that if they just did it once, eventually over time, it'll fall off. But yeah. the 92 year old woman is a perfect example. Cause you said she was 17 when it happened in France and then yeah. she's 92 and it was still there and she still had to still be there. set free. Yeah. And when she was set free by the power of the Lord, she felt such, a, I mean, she said, I feel so light. I could run 10 kilometers. I feel like this mighty weight came out of me, this darkness, this oppression. She was laughing in the spirit. She was so joyful in the Lord. And imagine carrying that because many of these spirits also come for many reasons. They express themselves in many ways, but Imagine a spirit that causes self-limitation in your life, where it limits your finances, limits your future, limits your walk with God, where it's limiting you in the way you think, the way you you you, you act, the way you, you've got potential in the Lord, a God-given potential. You have the Holy Spirit, but there's always a barrier, always a barrier all the time. And that's because when we open portals in our life, and many times these portals are open just simply because we've listened to a friend who invited us to go to his house and to play the Ouija board or to, you know, uh, get this paper on the on, on the table, write a few numbers, put a candle on it, and then call spirits. I mean, I, in Argentina, when I was teaching there, I was there for at a school, a uh, high school. In the primary school, these kids were seven, sorry, they were 12 and 13. They were practicing, the, 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 it's a game with the cup. They call it the game of the cup. They put it on a paper, they put these numbers, and then they call a spirit. 12-year-old kids holding their hands at school behind the, 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 the school building, right? They found a, uh, a table, they put the table there, and one of them who was an ingenious, he said, let's try this, let's, you know, just to play around. And, and they had turps, a bottle of turps on one side on the same table. And they had a candle right next to the cup because this is how it's supposed to be. But I don't know why they brought the turps, which is inflammable. They put it on the other side of the table and then they joined hands and they were calling the spirit. The spirit comes. This is in Argentina, up north of Argentina. And just very occultic, you know, at the border of Brazil and, and Uruguay, very occultic, uh, even in the farms areas. and all. There's a lot of occultism, a lot of witchcraft, 
it, it, that just breathes in the air because that's how people live. But these kids, and these kids, this was a private school. So they were pretty, the kids were pretty elite because, you know, they, their parents were working in government and this and that. But anyway, they put their hands together and they call that spirit. One of the kids said the fire, that was the, 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 the candle, the fire went away. It just jumped like a flame and it hit the turps. It melted it and then it exploded. And when it exploded, the kids were holding hands and then they went back and fire was being caught on their hair and their shoulders. The fact they had the school uniform, they were running like crazy. Many of them got pretty bad burns. And then, of course, uh, when this happened, the teachers ran out. They wanted to see what was going on. They were trying to, you know, calm the kids down, putting out fire. They didn't know what was happening until the, the pr uh, principal came, the director, and then the parents came. And then they found out that they were playing this occultic game, 12 and 13-year-olds. So this is not something. Some people say, oh, let's not talk about that in front of the children. Children know more, especially today, they get involved in more things that parents don't even have an idea about, especially with the gaming today. From Dungeons and & Dragons and all the way deep into the games, it is horrific. Dear parent, if you're listening to this, your children cannot, if they're involved in any way with friends or even the wrong friends, and they're trying to introduce them in some way through the gaming, they can introduce them through the occult. And when you start seeing that your child has changed his character, the way he talks, the way his deme demeanor, um, he becomes very restless, he becomes very violent with you. Become, you know, when there's these type of changes, you know there's something serious going on. And only the Lord Jesus can heal that son, that daughter, that child. Because um, you can take him to a doctor, you can take him and all that. And I'm not saying you don't, please. I'm saying, yes, do take them, use your doctors and all that. But you will realize that the answer is not there. They'll help him in some way, yes. But if it's a spiritual thing that they got into, only King Jesus can help them. Only Amen. the Lord Amen. And for that to happen, that needs through prayer and deliverance prayer to cut off the tie that's been connected at that moment with the child because that is a, uh, a legal right that the child has done with the demon, yes, because they have opened that willingly out of their will. Just like you give your life to the Lord out of your will and you open your heart to the Lord and say, Lord, come in to my life. The same way a child or a youth or an elderly person can do that if they say to Satan, come, and or you're calling spirits and all that, that's what happens. And that is that is everywhere, you know, whether you go to an island or sometimes islands are worse because of what's happening there. But uh, it's incredible what's happening. But the glorious thing for us to understand, although we're talking about this, we're getting to the point, the greatest thing is the glory of God. And the Lord has the answer. But we need to understand where the problem is. And this is an issue today. And that's why I've written out of this book, I Saw His Glory, my life journey since I received the Lord. And how the Lord began to teach me and direct me and help me to see the reality of this darkness, of, of the world of darkness, the spirit of darkness. And... Uh, and then how the Lord began to teach me how to pray for people, how to really pray for them and see freedom in Jesus' name. So before we get into the good stuff, the good, good stuff, um, yeah, you said on. some more things. And I'm so glad you mentioned Dungeons and Dragons and yeah. Yeah, Pokemon, all this stuff that kids think are innocent. And even college kids play this yeah. stuff and they think yeah. it's harmless. Now, oh, no. I want to go to when you mentioned how you cast out a demon out of a person and you spoke to the demon and the demon told you lucifer lucifer promised us everything and we got nothing and yes. that sounds like the same trick he's doing now he's promising right. people the world he even offered jesus everything right he yeah. offered him yeah. everything on a cliff 
he's doing the same thing now with um celebrities with like you said the music yeah. all these things he'll he'll give you just a little bit but then in the end you get nothing but hell one of the things i i was with uh luis palau the great evangelist has now gone to be with the lord and i was in one of his festivals um evangelistic festivals that they were holding and they brought in celebrities christian celebrities to also be part of the festival where they they sang and all that and i met up with el puma rodriguez uh the famous singer uh, in latin america he's called uh el puma and uh he's in his 70s now and uh but he was so famous worldwide you know in latin america north america millions and millions of people following him but it was interesting how he told us a story how he being already at that level super super star super famous he had everything he didn't know the lord yet and and he said but there was such a thirst in my soul that i wanted more and more and more and even in religion i wanted to try things and then he got into the wrong thing which was the occult and it was at that high level in hollywood and you know these high level places where he was introduced and he could not get out of it it was a horrible thing that he went through and it was only through the preaching of the word of god and then later he came to know the lord and uh and that's what freed him the power of god you see whether you're a superstar today or whether you're a child living in a a small town a small place demons are roaming around the earth and 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 they have a mission the mission given to them by lucifer is to take as many souls as possible to hell that's his mission there's no other mission nothing else but that because he knows he's going to hell and he wants to he's always wanted to go against god's plan and god's purpose and when he saw that christ did not stay dead at the cross but was buried and rose again on the third day you know the lord crushed him and and the lord judged him there and the final judgment is coming uh soon at the great white throne where he will be cast into the lake of fire and that lake of fire has been prepared for satan and his angels but also for all the people that reject god reject his love uh don't want anything to do with the lord it's it's so sad but the lord gives us a free will he's not going to you know grab us by the hair and say you got to receive me but he loves people he loves every person the lord is not willing that any should perish that's his heart he wants to save people but people have a will people make decisions and that's placed in our hearts since the moment we're born we already have a will and we make decisions and in the same way when he created angels he gave them a will he did not create robots to worship him the lord created even spirit beings that would willingly worship the creator but what happened when lucifer because of his standing and because of his beauty and because he was directing the worship in heaven he was a musical instrument in himself he was so glorious and majestic but pride <laughs> i say it like that i tell the youth pride you know pride was found in him and when that was found in him yes the lord said you must leave this is your judgment pride is the greatest sin that man can ever commit because that was the first sin that satan committed but even before he left he had convinced a third of the angels to follow him now in order to convince a third of the angels he must have used some strategies that he must have given them such promises that they were so convinced and this fallen angel the demon when i spoke to it it told me that they were promised many things that they would have a new world and they would overrule god and the sin that was already in lucifer you see that's why sin is so deceptive sin is so horrific the sinfulness of sin is so amazingly horrible it tainted all of the creation yes when he came to man and man listened to satan and not to god it just corrupted mankind it even tainted our world because this world should be like eden right now 
but because of sin, it started degenerating. And demons, when they followed him, they were they were so you know excited that this is our new leader. And then when God judged them, and they left, their swords were taken away because angels have swords. Their swords were taken away. All the all the glory that they had was taken away from them, and they became deformed, and they began to experience things they never before experienced, like fear, like pain, like sin, like separation. If you think about it, these are things that these angels never experienced before, like being outcasts, not being in heaven anymore. And then you can imagine the the dread and the uh, the disappointment, um, that's not even a word really for them. There must have been something so horrific to know that they've been cast out, that there was no victory with Lucifer. So he deceived these angels, and that's why he's the father of lies. The Bible says, the Lord said he's, when he rebuked the Pharisees, you know, that were rejecting Jesus, you are of the father, the devil, he told them. These are harsh words. He never said that to a prostitute, never said that to a, a publican or a sinner because the Lord had mercy. But when pride came into the religious realm in the uh, erudites of that time who were rejecting Christ and rejecting the miracles, he told them, you are like your father, the devil. You're a liar. There's deception in you. And they were deceived. And, uh, and when I told this demon, you should have been in heaven glorifying the Lord. You should have stayed there. This demon got so upset, Jennifer. He was screaming out at me. He was saying, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your family. How dare you remind us of this? He was horrific. Of course, I told him, you're not going to do anything because the Lord is here. You're going to be chained up. There were the angels there. Chain him up with eternal chains and send him back to the pit of hell. You're not going to do any of that because Greater is he that is in me, and greater is the Lord who stands before you. And he's already conquered your master, so you are already defeated. But the rage that demon felt, this fallen angel, was basically, as I could understand it, is facing the reality that, yes, I was deceived. I'm living this hell now, and I will be judged forever in the lake of fire. So that world is, is an incredible world. I'm not saying everybody has that experience with demons and uh, because our focus is not the demons. Our focus is the glory of the Lord. But the focus has to be at times with demons so we can cast them out. Yes? And you find out many things that they go through and uh, they get punished severely. You know, once they leave the person, they have left the mission that they have been given. And when they go back and report, because they do have to report, they get castigated. They get, it's an old word in English, but they get so battered because they fail the mission. So it's an amazing thing, Jennifer, and I speak to the audience, that these demons, they, they know mankind because they've observed mankind for thousands of years. They know how we react. They know what tempts us. They know how we could react in certain situations. And, and, and they're there. And the whole mission is to destroy mankind. But praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that God knew that and he brought the solution to our world. It's found in Jesus Christ. And we're more than victors. And now we can come from another side, from glory, to bring the glory to other people. The deliverance, the freedom to children. And all this, you didn't even know because you were, a, you became, like you said, the Baptist pastor of the church where you got born again. <laughs> and yeah. you pastor a church, you're Baptist, and you forget all about, you know, the haunted house when you were 13 years old. And yep. a Pentecostal woman comes to your church. And what does she say to you that makes oh my goodness change in your life? This is where the beautiful thing happens, people. And I'll rush it a little, not rush it, but I'll, I'll, I'll be more precise. Uh, I'm still in a Baptist church. I'm actually, when I'm pastoring now in 2002 onwards, I'm pastoring my home church when I arrived in 1973. 
So the same group that I arrived in 1973, when I was eight years old, now I'm 34 years old, and I'm pastoring that group. And I'm pastoring my Sunday school teachers. <laughs> I'm pastoring people that have known me since I was eight. And they so tenderly and so lovingly, graciously embrace me as their pastor. But what's happening here is this. And I told this to my church once. I preached it when the Lord began to transform my life with his presence. I said, Jesus is not a denomination. <gasps> Praise Jesus. Before, say it again. Wait, wait. Say it again. Say it again. Jesus is not a denomination. <laughs> one more time. Hold on. One more time for those who aren't listening. <laughs> Jesus is not a denomination. Amen. He's a king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. <laughs> and, and that's something to rejoice because... When we get sometimes these things, you know, sometimes we are so denominational and we embrace that so tightly that like I did, right, that I put the Lord in a box in my theological framework. Where I went to, the, uh, to, to study was a great college. I love the college. But they were missing out in one area of signs, wonders and miracles because they were cessationists. They believe that, okay, that only happened in the time of the apostles and time of Jesus, and then Elijah and Elijah and Moses, and it's going to happen again in the tribulation uh, before the Lord comes. They they set it out like that in three periods. And, of course, you know, we were I was 19 years old. I was learning God's word, and and I received that, and, and I said, wow, that's incredible, amazing, and we received the teaching. And then, of course, when the Lord interrupts <laughs> theological framework this is beautiful but also it takes a bit of time to really understand that what i was taught was not correct because the lord is the same yesterday today and forever and the lord made sure that i understood this very clearly but it all started with a, a sister pentecostal sister was coming to our church you know she could see in the spirit the lord would open her spiritual eyes I was amazed of, of her love for the Lord and her walk with the Lord. And she could see things in people's lives that the Lord would reveal. And I was shocked because I'm here, a Baptist pastor, and, and, and I'm seeing this. And then she gives me the question, is the glory of God in your life and your ministry, Pastor John? You're missing something. Oh, my goodness. Now, theologically, like I told Jennifer, theologically, I was thinking, okay, Moses, Mount Sinai, the glory of God. I was thinking all theologically. But she was saying, no, no, you, 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 Pastor, Pastor John Green, do you feel that glory in your ministry? And I knew I didn't. Now, I was a child of God. I had already supernatural experiences with the Lord before, but I did not follow that through because I didn't know how to. But it was at this time that the Lord had mercy once again. And he said, this beautiful sister, she asked a question, and that led me to a quest that began with great frustration, but ended up in glory. And let me tell you something. When the Lord is going to show you his glory, it often starts with a lot of frustration. I mean, even Moses, before he saw the burning bush, man, he was doing work that was so mundane. For 40 years, he, in his mind, he was, that never went out of his mind. He had killed an Egyptian. He said, I'm done. I'm finished. Yes, I've got a wife and family, but 40 years living in the wilderness. And yet the Lord had to wait that long. So all the people that knew him had died. So when he would come back, <laughs> he would move in the power of God. And it wasn't until he saw that burning bush and the call of God upon his life that things began to change. And oftentimes... The Lord will give you time that maybe you're driving right there on the highway. You're listening to this. God is calling you. He even called you when you were younger. I see that. I know there are people out there that they've been called when you were younger. And for whatever reason, you've left that call in a little box somewhere, hidden away, because you've tried to disqualify yourself. You, you've said to yourself, surely God cannot use me. And you've hidden yourself by doing many other things. And God is calling you right now. He's saying, I have not forgotten you. I have purpose. I have a beautiful destiny for your life. And today, I will begin to work in your life. Just like he did with me. 
he will do with you. If you would only stop, and I'm telling you, if you're driving and you need to stop right now, and you're a mom, you're in the kitchen, you're washing dishes, you're an entrepreneur there on the phone, and you're listening, sort of listening to this, and you're on the phone, better stop right now, park the car. Because what the Lord has to say to you right now, it's vital. It will transform your life. And let me tell you something else. There are people that are waiting for you, people that need you, people that are waiting to receive the Lord, but you've been running away or you've thought that God will surely not use me. Well, if he used me, a little John in a Baptist church that I battled when I was a youngster with low self-esteem, I had no confidence. I was shy. This is when I was about 15, 16, and I was shy. I was timid. I could not even speak in front of my teachers. One, my arts teacher told my dad in a parent-to-teacher meeting, he said, your son will never amount to anything. He doesn't talk. He doesn't speak because I was limited. I, at one point in my life, I was 17. I wanted to take my life away. I was under the attic in my parents' home, and I was under such oppression that when I was there, I, there's darkness over me, oppression. And the enemy wanted to wipe me out. And I was under there. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? I don't want to live anymore. I hate this life. And then all of a sudden, my mother opened the door. And she said, my son, what are you doing here? And I just burst it in tears. And I screamed at her. I said, I want to die. I don't want to live anymore. Maybe you're feeling that right now. But I want to tell you in Jesus' name that he has a purpose for your life. That he's saying, come with me. Grab my hand. And I will take you to places you've never been before. You'll be able to preach the gospel to children, maybe to disabled children and the disabled. And the Lord is going to use you with signs, wonders, and miracles. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people that are faithful and are available, that are saying, here I am, my Lord. I don't have blue blood in me or royalty. I don't, maybe I'm not a top entrepreneur, but I want you to use me. And when the Lord hears that, that's all he needs. This is so beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm emotional at the moment, Jennifer, because I'm feeling the presence of the Lord that I, the, there are people out there right now that the Lord is touching. There are people right now that are going to be hearing this, that their life is going to turn around because there are hundreds of people that are waiting for you and only you can share the, the gospel with them. Only you can speak, you tell them your story. And the Lord is waiting for you. Just like Jennifer, who started this program. And may I have the liberty because the Holy Spirit is telling me this. She started something. The Lord gave her a vision. And she's and I praise the Lord for deep believer. I praise the Lord for this program. This program that is reaching people out there with mighty Godly education from the word of God, from miracles, signs, and wonders. And I praise the Lord for that. I give the Lord all the glory. And let me tell you something. When you say yes to the Lord for his calling, my dear friend, my dear young person, you could be 10 years old, 11, you could be five, and you can hear the voice of the Lord, of the Spirit calling you out. All you have to say is yes. Here I am, Lord. My son was 10 years old. He's 22 now. 10 years old, the Lord called him. Uh, you know, he understood the gospel. My son is autistic with developmental delay. But at 10 years old, he understood the gospel when he saw a video about Jesus and when Jesus died on the cross. That was so impressionable to his mind. And my own wife led him to Jesus at that Sunday school class at our church. You know what he did that same day? I had finished preaching. I didn't know anything of this. I came after we, we said goodbye to the people. We came in to have lunch. And my wife told me what happened. And I hugged my son. I cried with him. And then all of a sudden, we're getting lunch together. And we were so joyful. But he stood up. He went to get about 20 of his toys and dinosaurs and bears. He put them all along the wall. And I'm saying, I wonder what he's doing. He put them all along the wall. And then he knelt down before them. And you know what he did? He said, now you, my friends, 
I receive Jesus in my heart. I want you to receive Jesus too. Oh, amen. That was amazing. Because for him, his dinosaurs and his toys were his friends because of his limitation. And that's a natural reaction when we come to Christ. We want to share it with everybody. But now the Lord is saying, I've already called you for something special. So if you're a mum or even a single mum and you say, can God use me? Yes, he can. In a mighty way. You're a truckie out there. I only drive trucks, my friend. You can become the, the next Billy Graham, the next preacher, the, ne the next Smith Wigglesworth, whom God will use in a mighty way. Don't limit God. Allow him to do the work in your life. Even if you start little by little, but every day, every day, that'll grow more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Well, it did grow more and more because by the, the second month, I was there eight hours in prayer in my church by myself, nine hours in prayer every night at first it's a struggle because our flesh doesn't want to do that and then lo and behold never expecting this i'm still at my baptist church seven years of my baptist church never expecting this and that last night i went back to bed my wife was in our room i went to the spare room and there i the lord was telling me you need to rest i rested i put my head on the pillow i closed my eyes and i opened them straight away i mean it was that quick and when I open my eyes, I see myself in heaven. I knew it was heaven because of the colors, glorious colors, and the atmosphere of glory was there. But my human reaction was, where am I? Is this heaven? And I was watching myself. And I was conscious. I could speak. I could hear. I could see myself. But then all of a sudden, I realized my hands are translucent. There's no flesh here. I'm in my spirit. My body was there resting. The Lord took me, my spirit out. And I was standing right next to a, a, an angel, 14 foot high. And the same angel that was with me while I was praying, the Lord sent him those three months to be with me. Because while I was praying, there was a demon in the church at the back part of the church who also came to try and haunt me. But this angel was there with me all the time, all the time, waiting for me. And when I saw the angel there, I just felt so such a, a unity knowing that he was with me all the time. But speaking of amazing, I mean, when you got to heaven, after you opened your eyes, you saw the throne of God in the Christmas yes. tree? Oh, my goodness. I was at the platform. There's this platform where the throne is placed. It's a translucent like crystal glass gold platform but the platform is so huge so massive in kilometers and there were hundreds and thousands if not millions of saints and there were angels different angels some with wings others without wings they were all there and i noticed that we were right there where the throne was because we were right central. I could see the, uh, and, and not only that, the Shekinah glory, the glory that, you know, of the presence of the Lord that radiates from God himself, that glory. I was saying before that uh, had I been there in my body, my body would, would have been obliterated. It's like being right next to an atomic bomb, but not that kind of power. I'm talking about a trillion times brighter than the sun. Why do you say that? Because that's the impression I got that straight away. This is a trillion. So in heaven, any measurements, any things you look at, you, it, everything's accurate. Everything's perfect. So you can see even the dimensions of things and you can tell how massive and how big they are. So it's not just to exaggerate. This is how literally it is that when you when I saw the Shekinah glory, it's just glowing all from there, from the very center, to all of heaven, this is what's this is what's shining throughout heaven. There's no shadow, there are no shadows in heaven. It's just glory and glory, and glory. But there I was at the throne, and uh, and this glory was shining. And of course, to my amazement, I was shocked. But I knew where I was, but pleasantly shocked. So there goes my theology, <laughs> my Baptist theology. And 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 I, I've told that to many ministers, your theology will just scatter and disintegrate to nothingness because the Lord is greater. 
And then, of course, I see all that glory. And then all of a sudden, I see everybody around me, every for kilometers. They all just turned around and looked to that glory with great expectation, with great joy. There was no announcement, but they knew that the Lord Jesus was coming out of that glory. Nobody stood there and said, hey, he, 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 he comes Jesus. It just appeared and he walks out of that glory. And I saw my master, my king. And when I saw him, he was only about literally 50 meters away from where I was. He comes out of the glory with a beautiful uh, kingly robe to his feet. And he had actually, I didn't say this before, he had a blue sash came from his shoulders across his chest to the waist, wrapped around and falls on his right hand side. Beautiful blue sash all the way to his feet. But this blue is no, there's no comparison to the blues here. I'm sorry, guys. The blues here are like ash. <laughs> in comparison to that blue there. <laughs> I actually asked a mighty prophet of God, and when he was hearing my story, you know what he was doing? This is a true prophet of God. He was telling me milliseconds ahead of me what I had seen because the Lord was showing him. And wow. then he said, the Lord showed himself like that to you because he wants you to know that you are, uh, you've called yourself a pastor, but you are more of a prophet than a pastor. And I was shocked. I said, but I've been with the Baptist church. And okay, leave that aside. I'm telling you what the Lord is telling me. <laughs> anyway, and I saw the Lord in all his glorious beauty, but I could see all of him, all of him. I mean, from head to feet. Well, speaking of that real quick, I know so many people, and you know, are wondering, what did Jesus look like? What did Jesus yes. look like? How was his appearance? Well, just like a Jewish uh, man with the, with the color, like, you know, his his skin is a, bit, a little bit darker than this one here. and But not dark, dark, but, you know, that, that type of... And and uh, his hair is parted in the middle, coming down to his shoulders. Beautiful. He has a beautiful trim, uh, perfect beard and mustache it's not not bushy nothing like that it's perfect it's 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 picturesque such perfection his face is so glorious when you see him is i mean angels are beautiful too you know how the lord created them some it seems like they're chiseled the way they have their jaws and all that but when you see the lord is so glorious he is perfection over perfection, glory over glory. And and uh, I won't get through all the details, only to the point to tell the, the viewers that uh, the angel said four things. You've been praying for weeks. This is heaven. He corrected me. He just wanted me to settle down. Yes, this is heaven. And you will see Jesus. And I was seeing him from a distance. But then he said, you, and he's coming to see you. And when he told me that, I was just so enraptured. And you know what happened? That glory that I was seeing there, one of the rays actually was coming towards me. And when that ray hit me, it gave me more life. I felt the love of God in such a powerful way. It pushed me back and I felt his life and his love. And it was like, oh my goodness. It was like just a river of love went through me. And I was already alive there, but this gave me more life and more love of the Father. It was like revival full on with, uh, you know, with turbo charge. Yeah. <laughs> and but that was you, just one little ray. But you told me you wanted to get to Jesus, but there's protocol there. Yes, yes. I thought I could run to him because I, I would say at my church, Lord, if I were to see you, I would run to you. I would throw myself at your feet. I would kiss your feet in adoration. I would do that, Lord. And this is in my mind. But when I'm in heaven, there's a protocol. Just like you go and see the queen or the king. You just don't go in there and say, hello, I'm here. <laughs> you know, you don't do that. Because the Lord knows when he's coming to you. It's a perfect time. And I had to wait. And, and I believe that the Lord told the angel, you stay with him there and you keep him there until I come to him. And that's what happened. I couldn't run. Even if I wanted to, 
I couldn't run to him. I was not permitted because it's not just me there in heaven. <laughs> there are millions upon millions of others, but yet the Lord did come to me. And as he walked and coming towards me, uh, his grace, his love was walking with him, his mercy, all these traits were walking with him. It's almost like you're watching him walking in such a kingly way, yet very humble, very meek, but with great power and authority. And he's coming towards you and every cell, if I can describe it like this, every cell in my spirit, if I, I'm only describing it this way, it's like a magnet towards him. It's just drawn towards the Lord because I know that he comes my creator. And when he stopped right in front of me, face to face, less than a meter, he's right in front of me. And he begins to watch me. He's, he's tilting his head, and I can feel that. I see it. And I'm being observed by him, and he was saying, I love what I have created. <laughs> he was talking about you, right? Yeah. And he does that with all of us because he loves what he has created. Even before he spoke to me, he just looked and watched me. And I felt, you know, when you feel that you, you're being watched but imagine face to face right next to you just watching and he's taking that little bit of time to say i love what i have created all self-esteem goes out you know the window like crazy <laughs> you're just loved by the lord and then when i saw his eyes i was it was like an ocean of love and compassion and him knowing all things and then you're exposed before him, like bang, like a, uh, you know, you're exposed before him. There's nothing to hide. You cannot come to the Lord with any excuse, anything that you're thinking about, because you can't. You just, you're exposed. But in a good way, not, not like guilty, but in a good way, you know you're exposed. He's all omniscient. He knows everything, all present, you know. And then the Lord said, and he spoke and he said, um, I know everything about you. You can hide nothing from me. But they weren't words of rebuke. They were words of just letting me know he's omniscient. He's powerful. He knows where I am. So in my mind, I could never doubt that the Lord is there with me all the time. Secondly, he said, my favor is upon you. And he did a beautiful smile. I mean, he stopped a smile. I, I, I've never seen it before, that smile. But it's so radiant, so beautiful. And it expresses friendship. It expresses love. That smile expresses uh, you are mine. So many things. And then he said, go and preach the gospel to the nations. Now, that came out with urgency. Urgency. Let me tell you something. The Lord is coming so soon. We are li we're not hearing about prophecy. We are living prophecy today. We're living it today. Forty years ago, I used to hear of great mighty men of God who spoke about prophecy and the tribulation, the millennium, all those things. We're living that right now. We're living it right now. The time is of essence. Time is of essence. That's why I hope you've stopped by the side of the road and then you can understand the Lord is coming back and he's coming back with his reward. Now, the question for me and for you is, what are you doing for the Lord? He's giving you talents. He's giving you gifts. He's giving you the word of God. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. He gives you a place where you can serve your local church or he's going to call you to the mission field. He's going to call you so you can give your life for people, to lead them to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ through faith. So the Lord is coming with his reward, and we will receive rewards in heaven. You know that. And uh, for what we've done for him and what we're doing for him. And, uh, and that's so encouraging, such powerful motivation for us. And the Lord is coming with his reward. Not only are we going to be in heaven, but we're going to be with him. He's going to reward us. And uh, the places where we're going to be, it's just going to be according to the desire of our hearts. 
and he's planning all those things for us. But here, uh, it is here on earth that we build treasures in heaven. Here. And the greatest treasures that you can build is saving souls, serving people, and taking them to heaven, sharing your testimony, leading them to Christ. That is the jewel of jewels. Because there's only two things that are eternal in this world. The word of God, because the Lord said the world will pass away, but my word remains forever. And then the souls of people, men and women and children and elderly people, they are eternal. So how you invest your time by reaching people and the Lord blessing your life and your family and your work, all those things are important. But the eternal things that you can build up treasure for the Lord in heaven by doing his will. And that's why I'm so happy, delighted, because, you know, when the Lord showed me heaven, this transformed my ministry and my life. Now, I still stayed at the Baptist church for another almost seven years. But it was there that in the last three years, because it took me a bit of time to tell my church, I actually told them a year and a half after my vision. It took me a year and a half to soak everything in, to understand why the Lord showed me what he did. And then once I shared it, I didn't share it fully like in front of the pulpit. I shared it first in a, uh, uh, a connect group on a Wednesday night prayer meeting took me about three hours to share just this little part that you're listening to because I was so taken by the Lord. And then they started noticing that I changed. My, my preaching changed. There was an anointing. And then the Lord said, okay, we're going to start up because I don't show myself just to show myself. He does it with a purpose. He says, now that you know that as John 14, 12 says, and I've got it right here, in the word of God, because he, this was one of the passages he took me so I can meditate and really put it into practice. He says, John 14, 12, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do will, will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. I battled with that verse for many, many months before having my encounter with the Lord. But when I had that encounter, this verse jumped out like a lion in front of me. And he it says, it's time now to do the works of the Lord. Now I knew what that meant. I knew that the Lord preached and teach. And that's where I stayed before. When I was a Baptist pastor, preaching and teaching. But the Lord said, uh-uh, that's only part of it. What about the miracles? What about the healing? What about the signs and wonders? And what about deliverance? So a fourth of the ministry of the Lord was deliverance. Another part was healing. So the gospel is, is a, a totality of the expression of the power of God for salvation. And that salvation also brings healing and deliverance. And there will be signs and wonders that will flow. And this is what I explain here in this book. It flows. The anointing must flow through your life. So the Lord only can give you that anointing so you can work and do the works that he said you're going to be able to do. Now, it, it needs that anointing because you have to realign your heart with the Lord. You have to be serious with the Lord. You have to get back in prayer with the Lord. And he will begin to show you how you can move in power. I, I, I prayed once to the Lord Jennifer about him teaching me how to pray. And guess what? I read books about prayer. I've, I've seen videos about prayer. I've, I've uh, watched and followed Benny Hinn and many others in prayer. But then I said to the Lord, Lord, I've done all of those things. I've, and, but now I want you to teach me. Because I am your disciple and you are my master. Because if you've taken me to heaven, now I understand that if I need something from you, I want to come to you and you're going to show me my Lord because I want to do your work your way. Six weeks after that prayer, every day a little prayer and the Lord showed himself in a vision and I saw him again in that beautiful vision 
And then he put a whole bunch of people in front of me that were all sick. And they were all sick. I could see them all sick, all twisted up. And, and there was one man at the back who was demon possessed. And the Lord said to me, these are exact words that the Lord said to me. He said this. He said, do you see all these people? I say, yes, Lord. They are all sick. <laughs> now, the Lord doesn't ramble and doesn't talk and talk and talk. and No, no, no. He's very specific. Yeah. And he states the obvious when he's teaching us. He said, do you see all these people? Yes, Lord. They are all sick. So there's no doubt in my mind that they're sick. One, because I see them. But secondly, because the Lord is telling me they're sick. Then he said, before even praying for them, he said, now, feel my compassion for them. And when you read the Gospels and, and there in Matthew and Mark and Luke, you will often see the expression that the Lord felt compassion for the multitudes, for people. Although there were multitudes, he could see each one and he felt compassion for them. Compassion. When you're going to learn to pray for people, for sick people, and deliverance, you must understand that we must come first with compassion for people. And compassion, his compassion was so powerful when he came to me. He came into my, 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 my stomach area and then he rose up. And I began to weep and cry like never before. But he wasn't a weeping and crying like saying poor people. No, no, no. It was the weeping of love and compassion for people. But it got to one point where I had said to the Lord, please take it away. This is going to kill me. It's too much. And he just gave me a little bit of compassion. But he wanted me to first have compassion on people. When we pray for people, even if there are a hundred that you have to pray for, go one by one and have compassion on each one. Amen. Because Amen. that's how the Lord heals. Amen. Even if you're surrounded by a hundred, when he comes to you, it's like you're the only one in the universe and his attention is upon you. And that's beautiful. So John, now you've had your first encounter yes. in heaven and you couldn't find, once you were done, you couldn't find anyone who could relate to you. And no. then you went to a church that you're yes. currently at now and the pastor, you're with now he's had that same experience and then in 2019 you went again could you tell us in detail how did you get yeah. there and wow. what was it like what did it look like well you know this was different this time again because when i had been to the throne and i saw glory and all that but this time i was praying to the lord i said lord i want to see more of heaven i really have a great passion and desire to see more can you show me more lord and that was my prayer for about eight weeks, just short prayer, directive. And then at the end of those eight weeks, I left my body, my spirit went up, and I was traveling through space. And the way I was traveling through space with a whole group of people, we were in our spirit and we were heading towards heaven. And the stars were just flying by us. We were going at such velocity. Then all of a sudden we could see the, the brightness and the glory of the Lord before us. And then we slowed down, we slowed down, slowed down, and we came down to heaven, but at the edge of heaven into a beautiful valley, beautiful valley, all lights. And then as and I, I tell the people, I say, look, there is heaven. We are approaching heaven. I'm telling the group. And we, we landed and we just kept on slowly walking there. And what happened was that the first thing I saw was these white stallions, horses, majestic white stallion horses. They were feeding themselves and they lifted their necks up, their heads up, and they saw us. And it's almost like you can tell they were waiting for us to come at that area of heaven. And these are the stallions that in Revelation 19, the Bible says that Christ will come uh, back uh, seated on a stallion, a white horse. These are majestic horses, bigger than the ones that we have here. 
very muscular, very, uh, you know, you can really say, wow, this is amazing. And, uh, and there were many, many more there because the hosts of heaven were also riding on horses. So there was the first thing I saw in this beautiful valley. And then you can travel throughout heaven at the speed of light almost, you know, at the speed of thought. So whatever we wanted to see, I just thought about it, and there we were. And then I wanted to see a little bit of the city of God uh, there in heaven. And all of a sudden, I'm right there uh, outside the walls and the, the, the gates, of the pearly gates. And I, I put my hand on that pearly gate. And as I, my hands were on that pearly gate, I could touch it. And all the senses inside of me were being delighted, and I was rejoicing. And I could just feel the smoothness of that pearly gate. And it was giving me such joy because whatever we touch, whatever we see in heaven, it's a continual joy and glory in the presence of the Lord. And I just cried out, look how beautiful this pearl of gate is. And it was so massive. I could not see the end of it as high as it was. And, and then I, I moved a little bit quicker to the end of this part of the wall. And then I was looking at the streets of gold. I, I bent down literally and I was looking like this. Look at the streets. I'm telling the group there, look at the streets of gold. Look how beautiful the Lord has created this for us. I was, I think, more of a guide at that time. and uh, ex But I was expressing myself with such delight and joy. And I could see that. And uh, I was rejoicing to see the streets of gold translucent clear, crystal gold, beautiful, like nothing here on earth. There's nothing like that here on earth. Nothing, no comparison. Even the greatest mansion here, the best mansion that can cost $100 million is like a tip, like a dump in comparison. There's no comparison, I'm telling you. And then, my dear friends, uh, I went to another section where there were angels waiting for us, and we're all coming together. And there was one couple that I knew, that I know, they're still alive, but they were there. And uh, in this section, I saw the thrones where we're going to be seated with Christ. Beautiful thrones, white thrones. We are already seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. But the Lord allowed me to see these thrones. And this couple came around me in front of me because the angel, one of them, escorted them so gently to come and sit down and said, please sit down. The angels are there to serve us. And the, the, these believers couldn't believe it. The radiance of joy and gladness. And they were touching the throne. And then they turned around to sit down. And the very motion of just touching the, the, the throne and sitting down was acceleration to the maximum of joy for them. And they were just rejoicing in the Lord. And all of a sudden, another angel comes and he brings them something. It was like a harp but that made out of jewels and gold and uh, all these things. And it was just glorious. And they rejoiced so much in that because they knew they were going to sing to the Lord. You see, in heaven, there's constant worship. And it comes from within you, and it just flows. You don't have to go to someone and say, can you teach me a little song here? Because I don't know any songs. <laughs> it just flows. And uh, because the Lord makes it that way. And then, of course, Another aspect of that trip was there just at that moment, uh, an angel comes and I wanted to see more and more. I wanted to know more. Of course, can you imagine you're in heaven? You want to see so many places. And he brings me a fruit in his hand. It's got a little smirk in his face because he knows what's going to happen. And he extends his hand down and he says, uh, take this fruit and eat it. And I looked at it. And as I, even as I watched the fruit, it was so beautiful, so tender. Even before I touched it, I knew it was tender and beautiful. And uh, it was like a, a, a comparing to a pear type shape with a kiwi. And uh, when I grabbed it from his hand, it was nice and soft, delicious and beautiful to touch. And then he's got this little smirk in his face. He's about to smile. I put it in my mouth. I, I bit it and it exploded like effervescence inside of me. It was so beautiful, so tasty. And I just delighted myself in that fruit. And guess what? The fruit comes and as it exploded inside. I'm eating it. And then it wasn't just a matter of swallowing it. It became part of me, all over me. 
It became you mentioned that the angel laughed. Yeah. He ate it. Yeah, because he saw my reaction. <laughs> <laughs> I was so joyful. <laughs> and I love, I'm a sweet tooth, right? And, and, but he was watching, he knew I was going to react because it was the first time I, I've been there to eat this fruit. And I just ate it and I must have put this face of delight while I'm eating it. And, and he started laughing. And uh, he, he really had a giggle of that. And that was awesome. And then, of course, another bigger angel came forward. This was a mighty angel that came. And, you know, there's no rivalry between angels. They, they all have a role. And they all come to serve. And they knew that. They knew this other angel was coming. He came down, floating down from the sky. And then he walks towards me. And then he says, come with me, this deeper voice. Uh, he says, come with me. And uh, I just went forward. I left the group there for a moment. I went forward and I just stood right next to him. And then we lifted off uh, into the into the sky. And there was a huge mountain before us, taller than Mount Everest. I could tell the difference and the distance, taller than Mount Everest. And all which is going up, 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 up. Here on earth, I'm scared of heights. But in heaven, you're not scared at all because you just, it's just part of you. You just look at all the scenery, the, the valley was so beautiful what the Lord has made. Similar things to here, but more beautiful and more gracious. He took me right up to the top and then we went over the top and a bit higher and then we suspended ourselves in the air and I could see billows of clouds of glory, the expanse of heaven. It was so massive. And there I saw the glory of God hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers ahead of me. And the angel just put his hand out. He had a beautiful white robe that just hang out and powerful. And he said, do you see that glory? I said, yes, sir, I do. Do you know who is in that glory? No, sir, tell me. And he said, that is where... The church of the Lord is worshiping the Lamb of God. So you saw the future. Yeah. So I'm looking at the future while I'm in heaven, knowing that the church is still here on earth, but the Lord shows you that dimension, what's going to be happening in the future. And he was just showing me the glory of the Lord and how the church would be worshiping. I'm talking about the church, the believers, in Jesus Christ, yes? The whole body of Christ was just worshipping the Lord, worshipping the Lamb, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And what you're describing is Revelation, right? It's described in uh, chapter uh, 21, where also John was taken up by an angel to a high mountain, very similar, and then he saw the glory of the Lord and where the Lamb is being worshipped. And this is what the angel showed me because I wanted to know more and more. Ah, did I tell, did I say what the fruit was called? I didn't, did I? No, you didn't. Well, the angel said, do you know what this fruit is called? And I said, I don't know, sir. What's it called? He said, it's called soon you will know. Mm. In other words, the fruit there has a characteristic of the desire of your heart. And because I wanted to know more of heaven, I know I'm going back very soon again. And my passion, my dear friends, is to travel more. I've already been to five continents. I've been to Africa, Pakistan. I've been to a little bit to North America uh, for nearly a year there in New York, South America. Uh, we've got other countries we're going to visit. We'd love to go there back to America and to share all these things with, with pastors and leaders because you know what? The Lord told me what was I was stopping the presence and the glory of God to flow through my church. And he had to show me that through all these experiences and taking me to heaven. And then when he showed me all that, he was saying, as a pastor, you were stopping the flow of my glory. But now that glory is going to flow through the congregation. And we had three years of revival, of healings, of miracles. In our worship time, we will be hearing angels singing. People would be having visions and dreams. It was wonderful. And then, of course, we moved here to the Gold Coast, where my pastor already had an encounter with the Lord in heaven. 
And then I was able to find someone who understood, you know, like you said, Jennifer, uh, someone that's been to heaven. And I, I was telling Jennifer that I miss the Lord so much. I know he's with me, but I miss him so much. I want to be with him. I want to have that intimate time with the Lord in prayer and worship him and learn at his feet. I tell the Lord every night, Lord, if you can, if you want to, you take me to heaven every night. I prefer to be there at the night, teach me. So during the day when I'm here, I can help people and pray for people. I can teach your word, what you're showing me. And we can bless people because the Lord is coming very soon. And this is why it's important for us to understand. Mm -hmm. The Lord is near. He's coming with his reward. And he's coming very, very soon. John, we're going to go a little bit back to when you were in heaven. And you told me previously that when you got to heaven, you noticed that the grass was alive. Could you describe oh, that? Oh, yes. You know, when I got there, we stepped on the grass. And then you you, you keep on stepping out on it. But it does, it's not crushed. Just come back again. And it's dancing. And you hear music from the grass. Worshiping the Lord. The atmosphere of heaven is, is, is worship. Everything is just exalting the name of the Lord. Everything there. So it was so beautiful to see that. And you're breathing the atmosphere of heaven. And uh, it's, it's such a delight. You know, when I came back, it was so difficult. Still is sometimes. So difficult. Because we live in the Gold Coast. And the Gold Coast is beautiful. It's like living in there in Miami, Florida. You go to beautiful beaches the ocean, the breeze, and we thank the Lord for all of this, but it's all ashen for me. It's like everything is semi-dead because once you go to heaven, that cannot be rubbed off. That is something that's just part of you, and, and you've got to learn how to live with that glory, and there's a great responsibility to get this message across to people. And I'm telling you, this is not... Just for pastors. I don't want anybody to think, oh, but you went through all of that because you're a pastor. No. Anybody who takes the Lord seriously, and if you were to tell the Lord, Lord, you say in your word, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. If you take that verse on board, the Lord is going to reveal himself to you. Amen. Amen. Now, what about you said that you saw and you touched the pearly gates. Yeah. So the gates look like, was it multiple pearls? Was it a whole lot of pearls? No, it was, was just it... one big, massive, huge kilometers of, of one pearl. And it was so beautiful. So, I mean, when you touch it, it's so smooth. And um, it was What did it beautiful. feel like, though? Like, I know you said it felt smooth. And you said glory or power went through you when you touched yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Because when you touch it, it's like... Because the presence of the Lord is there. Uh, everything that is made is made on the basis of glory. And when you touch it, it's like this current goes right through you. This life, the delight, the joy of the Lord. So it's not just like, you know, touching there. You go, I go outside, but the gate is there. You touch it, oh, it's metal. It's a bit icy, a bit cold. No, no, no. Every, all your senses are are delighted just by what you watch, what you touch, what you eat. And it won't be like here on earth. You know, we're humans. We eat down the esophagus in the stomach. We know the rest over there. It's, it's That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because it, you just become part of it. You're renewed. And everybody's very youthful there in heaven, around 30 years old. So everyone's very youthful. And may I say that uh, because... Uh, my my son, can I say this about my son? The Lord allowed him to see my father. Mm. I didn't tell you this, but it's always a little thing there. My father passed away 20 years ago. My son was only two years old. So my, my son barely met my dad, saw him, because we were living in Argentina. But as soon as it was in heaven, with the Lord with children, he... Uh, at one point, he moved away, and my father approached him. 
And my father recognized him straight away because in heaven you recognize everybody. You don't you don't say, who is Jesus? Where's Abraham? I can't see. I don't know who he is. You know, everything, because everything's perfect. Your mind is perfect. You know who people are. And my father said, Alan, what are you doing here? Now, the last time my father saw him, he was only two years old. Now he's 10. Wait, but really quickly, how did your son get to heaven? Okay, because I, 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 he wanted to know what manna tasted like. He saw it on uh, on a cartoon, YouTube Christian movie, and then he was curious. Daddy, what does manna taste like? And I said, well, son, it's sort of fluffy. It tastes a little bit like honey, but you know the best thing you can do? Ask the Lord to show you what manna is like, you know? And I'm sure he must have prayed. He took my word literally because children who are autistic, they take everything very literal. He took it literally. He began to pray. And then one morning I went to wake him up and his face was radiant. It was glowing. And I sat next, to, not sat, I lay next to him on the bed. And I said, Alan, I was going to wanted to talk to him, but I saw his face, his countenance was shining. And then he began to talk to him and say, Daddy, I was with Jesus last night. I was with Jesus. I was in heaven with children. And he began to talk and talk. And he couldn't stop. He began to talk. Midway through, I said, wait, 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 wait. And I got my recorder on my phone. And I put it on record. And well, I've got this recorded. And I said, start again. And he started again. And the same story, the same expression. And in that, uh, he was telling me how the Lord took him to heaven. And that he he brought him manna. <laughs> oh. The Lord brought him manna and he took it and he began to eat it. And he was telling me, oh, it tastes like honey. It's very fluffy, very nice. I said, that's excellent. And what else happened? And then he says, and then the Lord brought, gave me living water, living water. And he got it with his hands. He put the water in his hands. And he put it down to my size and I went to drink and I began to drink a little bit. And then I saw the holes in his hands. And he said, and then I put my hands on my face and said, oh, the Lord has got holes in his hands. Because he remembered he had been crucified. And, and that was his reaction. He put his hands on his, on his face and said, the Lord has got holes in his hands. Look, but he gave me living water and I drank from there. Oh, it was beautiful water, he said. And then he said, what happened then? And then this lion, this great lion, started coming, running towards me. And I said, were you scared? Oh, no, Daddy, you're not scared in heaven. You're not scared in no, heaven. No, Everything's in good. Heaven. And this lion came right next to him. And I said, what did he do? He began to lick me. He was licking his face. <laughs> <laughs> was Jesus playing when he did the... Yes. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I know you mentioned that, and I just couldn't yeah. stop laughing. Yeah, he was playing humor. with Alan. Yeah, he grabbed his hand, and he was dancing with him, and then he gave him the, the manner, the, the living water. They were playing. and, and uh, So Jesus was and looking at him through the holes of his hands. Yes, he saw the, <laughs> the hands and his feet. And, and, you know, the lion came and licked him. He was so happy to see that. And then after that, it was where he saw my father. My father saw him and uh, he said, Alan, what are you doing here? He said, oh, I'm playing with Jesus. And my father told him, he said, uh, and how is my son? He's asking for me. And Alan told him, because I asked him, what did you say to him? He says, oh, he's fine, but he misses you so much, grandpa. He misses you so much. Oh, my dad said, tell him that we're going to be together very, very soon. Mm. Okay, Grandpa. And then he went back to Jesus and he was playing with him. And I told, and, 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 and when he was telling me this, there's a photo of my father. He, he passed away when he was 66. And I brought the photo straight away and I said, did it look like this? And he looked at my dad at 66, a little bit older. Oh, no, 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 not like that. I said, what do you mean? But that's when you last saw him. Oh, no. He was young. And then I went to get another photo and I brought it. And that was when my dad was about 32. 
And he said, yes, like that, mm. very young. And that was so beautiful. That comforted my heart too, because, you know, I miss my father so much. Yeah. And the Lord, in a way, by using my son in that experience, and he was only 10 years old when this happened. And ever since then, the Lord has given him the gift of healings. My son, Alan, who's autistic with developmental delay, but he loves the Lord so much. He loves him so much, but he prays for people and the Lord just uses him and he just rebukes the sickness, or even with demons. He hates the demons and he wants to rebuke them and he wants to kick them out. And <laughs> he's very forceful in his prayer. And people say, oh my goodness, he's really praying. Yes. And then once he finished praying with you, now you've got to have faith because if you don't have, you don't get, you don't get well. You must have faith in the Lord. And he will heal you. Don't worry. And once my pastor had a very bad shoulder, he got operated in a very sore shoulder. And we were saying hello to him. And I said, Alan, come over here. Pastor Rodney Gilchrist, he's got a very sore shoulder. Can you pray for him? Oh, oh no worries. I'll come now. I'm coming. I'm coming. And he puts his hand on his shoulder. And he said, in the name of Jesus, I said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, be healed, you shoulder. All the tendons, all the muscles, be loose right now. Receive the healing of the Lord. And he's praying this way, right? And and he prays, and then he sort of opens his eyes to see whether Pastor Rod is feeling it. And then that's it. He said, in the name of Jesus, amen. And then he pats him on the back. <laughs> he <laughs> him on the back and said, okay, you're going to be fine. The Lord has healed you. And then Pastor Rod, he started moving his shoulder and he was completely healed. Oh, praise God. And and that's what heaven does. That's what the glory of the Lord does. And your son did say that when he was there, he saw so many children, right? Yes, he saw many, many, many children. And they were happy, and obviously. They were all joyful, all joyful and all waiting for their parents. Oh, wow. So wow. if, if, if there's a mom there at, at the moment listening to this, you've lost your child or even uh, in abortion or things like that, you've lost that child or a miscarriage, that child is waiting for you in heaven, mm -hmm. waiting for you because they know that uh, they are in heaven and they, they know that mom and dad need to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So they too, when they get to heaven, you'll be able to embrace your child and uh, the Lord will give you that massive joy of all the pain that you went through and all the sorrow that some of you are carrying right now. Rejoice in the Lord for they are there and they are waiting for you. And that's the beauty of it. And Alan saw so many children and the Lord is so beautiful the way he plays with them. You know, he adapts to them Amen. <laughs> and they love him so much. And the first thing I, I, the Lord said to Alan, said, Alan, I love you so much. <laughs> the first words that he told him, because Alan told me, this is what the Lord told me. The first thing he said, Alan, I love you very much. See, in the, in the Christian life is a supernatural life. And yeah. I love how you and your son were able to go to heaven. And it was a, in God's eyes, it's a normal thing. And you come back and you share your testimony to bless so many others with this promise of heaven. If we just yes. turn Amen. to Jesus and receive him as savior and Lord. Now Amen. I want you, I know you've been sharing it the whole segment, but could you just show us your book again and tell us what your book is about? This is, this is part of the package. It's, it's, it's you're going to receive it as a PDF version. So it's digital, uh, but it says, I saw his glory. And in this book here, you're going to get the whole story of from the moment that I came to the Lord, for example, a boy called by God, one of the chapters, and then I speak about demons, where do demons come from, uh, my encounter with demons and angels sent by God and their ministry amongst us, you will learn a lot about that, uh, my encounter with angels, not only in the haunted house, I've had other encounters with angels too, uh, then I speak about who is Jesus in this uh in this ebook and a vision of the glorified Christ. Then I get into a little bit of healing and deliverance. 
and then how to walk supernaturally with the Lord in a natural way, but supernaturally, so the Lord can use you in a mighty way. And that's all in the pack that plus the 16 uh, sessions that I did on just deliverance, plus four videos that explains to you the four steps that I took in those three months that prepared me before I was taken to heaven. And those four videos are nice and precise, but if you would practice um, what I've learned, because this is all coming from the Lord, what you're going to see in here, if you practice that, the Lord will surely, surely come to you in a special way and you will never be the same again. How can we find your ebook? Well, uh, you're going to find it as you scroll down just below on, uh, on this YouTube uh, program. You're going to be able to get the details under there. Both follow me on uh, Facebook and you'll get the link there of my uh, to get access to the to the actual material, the pack there below on the link. And that'll be very accessible for you to get in there to find out more about our ministry. I'm a pastor evangelist and uh, I've been traveling around and we're needing to reach so many more people with the gospel and share in conferences with pastors and people like yourself about how to walk supernaturally with the Lord. So you get all the links in there, plus my uh, my personal email. And, uh, and soon I'm going to be coaching also on Zoom on, on deliverance and healing for those who really want to know more and want to really get some good training. I'm more than happy to do that uh, to bless your life so the Lord can use you in a mighty way as you look further down on those links. Yes. And in the description, I know a lot of you have been um, concerned about finding the description. It seems as if YouTube may have changed the format. I'm not sure, but you can locate it where it has the view count. So right under the description, yes. look right under that and you'll see view count and you should have an option that says more. Just click more. And that's the description. I don't know what's going that's on right. with that, but, yeah. but check that out. And so Pastor John Green, could you yeah. do me a big favor? Could you of pray? Course. Amen. I know you're like, this is, this is your arena right now. <laughs> could you do us a favor and could you pray for those who are, um, who have a stronghold of theology and denomination? And yes. could you pray for them um, to allow the Lord to soften their heart, to break down those barriers so they can Amen. actually encounter the real raw manifestation and power and love of Jesus. Of course we feel the love all the time, but you know, just to, to know that God is not like you said, in a box and yes. he can't be put in a box. So could you just pray for those yes. religious strongholds to be broken in Jesus's name? Amen. Let's pray wherever you are right now, receive the glory of the Lord in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is right beside you right now, wherever you are. The presence of the Lord is coming upon you right now. His mighty glory, his mighty presence, because his love for you is so amazing, so great. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you because you are besides all the people that are listening right now. Even if there are children and elderly and moms and dads, and young people and youth and young adults, professionals. And we pray right now, oh Lord, especially that you may break away the chains of denominational uh, beliefs that have encapsulated people that has brought them, Lord, into uh, put place shackles upon them, limiting you, oh Lord, for that spirit of unbelief and that spirit of doubt. We pray in the name of Jesus that it may be broken over the audience right now in the mighty name of Jesus and that the eyes of their understanding may be fully open so they may see the glory of the Lord. They may be touched, oh Lord, right now, so they may understand that you are not a denomination. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you will do great and mighty miracles upon the lives of, of, of the people that are hearing us right now, that are following us. Oh, my Lord, I pray right now that as you are calling people so they may be servants, so they may be used with your glory, Lord, to break other grounds, Lord, other 
uh, territories, oh Lord, wherever you're going to send them, I pray that you may fill them with your Holy Spirit. And as they look at, in, in, in this pack, oh Lord, that you may touch them in such a way that they will never be the same again, but they will reach thousands of people around the world, Father. That you may break and shatter away, Lord, all limitations of theology that puts you in a box, Lord. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you may show all people, Lord, that are listening to us right now, that their, their, their hearts may be open, that you may reveal yourself to them, even in dreams and visions, and we give you all the glory and all the praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. John Amen. Green, thank you once again for this amazing, phenomenal interview. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you for your ministry. May God bless you.